Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic. And I'm Jamel Bowie. I'm a staff writer at Slate. So, Jamel, you and I have both been talking uh, in a lot of our pieces about Ferguson lately, um, ever since the uproar that followed um, a young man walking down the street unarmed and had an altercation with police and was shot and killed and protests followed. And there's been a lot of writing about both uh, the shooting itself and the protests that followed. Um, to, to start off, do you know where um, where they are in the process of that investigation right now? Well, right now there's a grand jury looking at the evidence. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, the date for the grand jury to sort of release its results um, has been pushed back or pushed forward back to January, um, early January, so we'll be a few months before we find out what the grand jury has to say. Um, from what I understand, the prosecutor in the case, Bob McCullough, has been, uh -huh. um, you know, not exactly aggressive in sort of like directing the grand jury to, you know, look for evidence or kind of find an indictment. Um, and I know for a fact that the community in Ferguson and sort of St. Louis County at large, or at least the black community, doesn't really trust that McCulloch will um, try to bring charges against Darren Wilson. I think the general assumption is that October or January will come and there won't be an indictment. And, uh, and if that is the case, then it's accurate to say that there could still be a federal indictment on civil rights charges? I'm not sure. Um, my my thinking is that we probably won't see a federal indictment on civil rights charges. Okay. Um, I just, I, I'm not sure that things are clear cut enough uh, for, for yeah. that to happen. But the Justice Department is basically, you know, putting the entire Ferguson Police Department under its close watch. And I wouldn't be surprised if it takes that step with the broader St. Louis County Police Departments, which all have similar histories and similar, um, you know, similar problems with discrimination and and uh, racial profiling. Right. Um, you know, what, one notion that I've had watching this part of the case unfold, the, the part with the police officer, um, and, and uh, Michael Brown, who was killed, it, it's just this difference that we have in, in the United States and in other countries, too, about the presumption of innocence offered to regular people and the presumption of innocence offered to police officers. Um, in other words, it's, it's pretty unthinkable that you would have um, an unarmed person shot on a public street uh, by a civilian, right, and have that person uh, not arrested and thrown in jail and, uh, and charged with something. Right. Uh, whereas with the police officer, this happens all the time. Um, and I've, I've been trying to puzzle through whether that is the right standard. My instinct is that it, it's not that, that uh, there should be parity between uh, police and civilians in, in these situations. So I, um, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to think... So you, you can sort of imagine a world where um, whenever there is a police shooting... Um, uh -huh. And it, the rules are as they are now. Police aren't; they don't get arrested. They uh, they go on administrative leave. But upon going on leave, that the police department and the prosecutor does an aggressive investigation of what happened, and that in some of these cases, police officers are in fact arrested and indicted, and they go to jail. Like in this world, where there's some sort of like workable accountability measure, I actually don't mind the idea that police officers aren't immediately arrested because they do in fact. Um, you know, when a police officer shoots someone, it is in fact, it may, it may in fact be a, a function of, you know, it might be a legitimate shooting. It might be something that, um, while unfortunate, happened um, because of the circumstances and, and not sort of an aggressive move or a careless move from the officer. The, the, sure. the problem is that there is really no accountability whatsoever. Um, that, you know, if you are a cop and you shoot someone, odds are good that the worst that's going to happen to you is you'll get death duty for six months. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, so I wrestle with this because I agree that there are, uh, you know, police officers are put in these situations all the time when uh, the use of force is justified. And that's just part of the nature of the job. It's part of the job society is asking them to do. Um, on the other hand, it, it's also the case that um, non-police officers, right, uh, can be in a situation where they use uh, violence and they're not breaking the law. Right. Um, and, you know, you can, I can imagine 
so, so it's not that I want every police officer arrested immediately every time uh, someone shot or, or any civilian. I, I just think that, um, you know, you have to look at the evidence uh, that's available at the scene. And if the evidence is uh, one person is unarmed and the other person has shot them, uh, that seems like a pretty good reason to, uh, to proceed with suspicion, right. right? It's not to say that there's never a case where an unarmed person uh, is shot for uh, a, a justifiable reason. It's just to say that, um, you know, uh, I'm sure civilians sometimes shoot unarmed people for justifiable reasons, right. but, but they're arrested or at least intensely investigated. Um, and, and I think that part of the problem and maybe one structural reform um, that you could see um, you know, in the average city, a prosecutor is relying on police officers to testify in the vast majority of the cases um, that they're bringing forth and hoping for convictions. And um, if if a prosecutor got on the wrong side of a police department, it could very they could very easily make the prosecutor's job extremely difficult. Right. Um, and f for that reason, it just seems like uh, there's a conflict of interest there, and we need some other. Uh, some other person, some other office that is deciding whether to file charges uh, when police officers are the ones uh, who may be guilty of a crime. You know, I, I agree. I, I read about this um, not too long ago, but just on, on every lo level of the um, police accountability chain, there is very little, there are very few institutions that are completely separate or or divorced from the police departments themselves. Internal review boards, obviously, are police, um, you know, even, even, and even in the case when you have uh, third-party review boards or third-party groups tasked with sort of finding accountability, they often don't have teeth. And they often don't have teeth because police departments and specifically police unions have been very effective at um, you know blocking any or, or stopping any political political movement to to rein in the conduct of police departments. I mean, I think here, you know, here's a situation where. Um, this is a particular kind of public sector union that may in fact really stand in the interests of the public. And that's something um, that isn't really talked about in terms of public sector unions since, since sort of the emblematic example of them are teachers. But I, I think, I think, you know, there, there has to be a discussion. You have to begin to look at sort of the, the problems of police unions because police unions um, have a very strong interest in making sure that their members aren't held accountable for things like, you know, killing people on the street. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to, to me, you know, I, I don't want to stop police from collectively negotiating their wages. I think that that's fine. Uh, I, you know, um, but the procedure by which a police officer is uh, removed from duty, the due process that they get or don't get, um, it, it seems to me that that shouldn't just be a normal part of contract negotiations with the city that they're working right. for. Right. Um, that, that it ought to be based on some larger standard because um, in, in this case, management and labor are not the only parties that are uh, implicated in this, uh, in this agreement we're trying to right. reach. Right. No, I, absolutely. Um, so did you, I, I assume you saw the video. Um, this is another video that was happening kind of as the Ferguson protests were unfolding. And this was uh, the man who approached uh, police with a knife and was kind of shouting and was, and was shot and killed by yeah. them. What, what did you think of that situation and, and how the police responded to it? So it's funny. I think I was, the, I was in Ferguson at the time when that happened and when it first happened and the first sort of report came down and this was a guy who had, had robbed a store, he had knives or had a knife and he was charging at the police and I thought to myself, unfortunate, um, but that actually seems close to a situation where a use of force was justified. Um, yeah. When the video came down and I watched that, and what the, what what it actually showed was a clearly mentally ill man mulling around with what appeared to be at worst a steak knife, um, uh -huh. and the police the police roll up on him and then immediately start firing. Um, you know, it. It makes me think that for the St. Louis County Police Department, and I would like, I would guess, you know, police departments nationwide, the standards for using force have just dropped dramatically, right? That there's, there was no attempt in that instance to, you know, form a perimeter around him to, to sort of 
end the confrontation without someone losing their life. Um, there's, yeah. uh, you know, around the time that happened, I, um, I, I, I guess I read or heard people say something to the effect of, well, every police officer decides that deserves to be able to go home at the end of the day. And I think that attitude has led, and I understand the attitude completely, obviously, but I think it's led to a status quo where the, you know, where police feel empowered to just use lethal force at the slightest bit of provocation. Um, and it's really disturbing. And it's really disturbing to think that um, police feel the right just to, like, kill people if they feel slightest, threatened at the slightest. Yeah, you know, um, I I'm sure we'll put up a link of this video on the sidebar because it really is, um, like you said, when you first heard about it, just a guy with a knife charging at police and they shot him. Um, it's amazing how much a video of a situation brings out nuances and, and, uh, and makes you think twice about it. Um, I guess my reaction watching it, if I were a prosecutor, uh, I don't see, um, I don't see how I could bring charges against those officers, legal charges. Uh, you know, the, the guy was, uh, you know, the guy was armed and was walking toward them and was not, um, listening to legitimate commands, I think, right. to stop or drop your weapon or whatever. Uh, if, if I were a police chief watching that video, I would not want those officers uh, to be on my force or at least not um, armed and on the street and making those kinds of judgment calls. And um, in, in the comments of that article and afterward, I interacted with some kind of a, a couple of police officers and people friendly to police. And, you know, went through a bunch of like training videos of how police are um, trained to handle knives. And they, they were trying to make the point that um, th the average person really underestimates how easy it is for an attacker with a knife if they're within a certain distance of you to suddenly go after you and, and, and injure or kill you. Um, and, and they're making the case that basically, you know, this is how police are trained to shoot. Uh, center mass instead of shooting at limbs because uh, in that kind of a situation you don't have the ability to aim very carefully your adrenaline's pumping etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, and you know in that situation with a knife it was certainly within their training to shoot and I guess my reaction was was that looking at the video they um, unnecessarily put themselves in a situation that led to making the call to pull the trigger immediately or not. Right, right. I mean, um, they didn't... They, they, oh, go ahead. They they immediately arrived and escalated the situation. They they kind of reached the point of, like, maximal conflict immediately, uh, and, and they didn't have to. And I really do think you're right that it's... Um, it's not... But it's not only a mindset of, like... You, you were mentioning the mindset of um, every police officer has a right to get home at the end of the day. Uh, and I do think that that's part of the mindset that is, that has led to this. And, and I too, like you think that it's, um, understandable in many ways that I think like this, but to me, the more problematic mindset is just, um, escalating every situation to the maximum immediately and, uh, making it about demonstrating, uh, power and controlling the situation immediately. Right. Um, and, and there are situations that call for that, right. But there are also situations, uh, you know, a mentally ill man with a small knife, for example, um, they call for trying to step back and de-escalating, right? And not forcing the issue immediately because maybe you talk to the guy uh, and it takes 30 minutes to talk him down, but then he just drops the knife and you don't have to shoot him. Um, and it isn't as if this doesn't happen all the time uh, with different police agencies, right? Um, you know, I, I've been sent various YouTube videos uh, about other situations that were handled with knives in different ways. There's this really amazing video from, uh, I think it's from England. Yeah, it's, I think it's where, like the London police. Yeah, it's like a guy with a machete, and there's all these police officers who are kind of like running around him and trying to hem him in, like really doing their best to, to control the situation without lethal force, um, to, to the extent that I was like, wow, I'm amazed that they're actually doing this. <laughs> um, um, but, you know... Um, it, it would be easier, I think, to have these conversations with uh, with police sources in a way that there was some back and forth if the answer to every scenario wasn't always, well, 
here is a way in which this could be technically justified. Right. Um, I mean, that, and yeah, yeah, that, that's what's kind of frustrating about these conversations is that you can't – often you can't bring up an example which you think is un, unnecessary police police force without someone bringing – like looking for a way to justify it as if, as if we should be okay with routine shootings even if they're justified. Um, you know, I, I don't think when I think keeping the peace or serving the community, I don't think that actually means gunning down anyone who could have the potential for violence. Um, and what's, you know, yeah. what you, you mentioned earlier that many police officers and, and presumably many police forces seem to have this policy of immediate escalation. And, you know, the, the knife, the guy with the knife in St. Louis is an extreme example. But if you look at any of the, you know, hundreds of YouTube videos, um, cell phone videos of people being stopped by the police for, you know, basically nothing. In every, in almost every case, what you see are police immediately turning the dial to 11 um, and immediately yeah. creating a situation where the person being stopped and the person being arrested is agitated, Um and that, that yeah. just that's just going to lead to trouble. I mean, the video of Eric Garner is a perfect example of this. Um, immediate escalation uh, that led to a tragedy. Yeah, I and I don't, you know, <laughs> I think that actually um, it, it's a little different from police, but I think this kind of interaction with um, authority figures vested by the state has um, has happened with a slightly bigger percentage of Americans since airline security got really tight after 9-11. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I see this same attitude um, in a lot of airport situations that, that both I've experienced and that, that other people I know have experienced where, you know, you'll be going through security and I travel sometimes with a jump rope to exercise, which I try and remember to take out because it always like uh, trips up the scanner or it, it like half the times trips up the scanner actually. Um, if I don't take it out and put it in the bin. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so it's just a matter of uh, my bag goes through and then if I forgot it in there, they open it up and look at it and I go, it's a jump rope and go on your way, right? That's all that's necessary in this situation. And sometimes that's all that happens. Uh, but other times, as soon as the person who is looking at the x-ray tells the other person, oh, we need to look in this guy's bag, right? The guy who is going to look in my bag, his manner toward me immediately um, it's as if like any minute he's going to find out that I'm a terrorist right. and it's just like a hostile attitude as if I've done something wrong, right? Like, oh, there's suspicion that I could have possibly done something wrong. Uh, so my attitude toward you is going to be hostile. And this is amazing to me because, uh, you know, it's happened, um, you know, it's happened several different times. I've seen this ha kind of same thing happen to other people. And this is a situation, right? Airports where, the vast majority of these things are false positives, right? right. The average TSA uh, agent is never in their career going to catch a terrorist. Uh, they have to go through this every single day. And to, <laughs> to be in that situation and to still react with this kind of like low grade hostility and antagonism, um, it's just a mindset I don't understand. And of course, uh, it's a whole different level when you're talking about uh, the police in an armed situation on the street and not the safety of an airport with an unarmed uh, TSA person. It's just like all, all kinds of differences, obviously, but, uh, but, but there's something I think about that mindset that's the same. And I don't entirely understand what it is uh, that, that brings that out in people. Neither do I. I mean, and I've had the same experience at airports um, and I've had, you know, I've had sort of hostile experiences with police, uh, you know, just getting, getting stopped for an inspection sticker in my car and the police approaching me like I'm at any moment going to uh, pull out a semi-automatic weapon. I mean, it's very, right. it's it's a mindset that it's just not conducive. I mean, it's, it's frustrating to experience, but sort of on a macro level, it's just not conducive to effective policing. Um, I don't, right. I don't understand how you can police community effectively, which in my mind means a community that, that is working with and cooperating with the police that is, um, you know, if not, if not okay with, maybe eager to provide leads to police, um, a police department that is, you know, working with the community both to deal with dangerous criminals, petty crime, um, and the kind of folks who are kind of on the border of criminal, just like all these things, 
that um, if you can manage well, you can create like a safe community. And these sort of hostile attitudes don't help any of that. I mean, what they end up doing is they end up putting the community against you and leaving you with a situation where, in fact, that attitude is the only way you can even manage. Right. Yeah. And I wonder, um, it's kind of an unknowable thing, but I really wonder the degree to which um, police would get more and helpful calls um, <laughs> if this if this tension uh, wasn't so present in so many communities and um you know it's 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 different uh although there are similarities across the united states it's, it's of course every community is its own place um but you know I, I know more and more people who after watching youtube videos of police encounters and actually especially of um you know there's all these videos of police coming in and shooting dogs yeah. with uh with with you know in many cases with little provocation. Um, and, you know, as uh, it, it's, it's something, you know, it's, it's unlikely that uh, my particular house, right, is ever going to be like uh, raided by a SWAT team. And, uh, but, but, you know, you look at like these uh, no-knock raids with the wrong addresses and I think about having a dog and it's like, God, that'd be the most terrible thing. Um, and I also, you know, I live in a neighborhood with a lot of homeless people in it, some of whom are uh, pretty uh, meth addicted and aggressive. And there have definitely been nights when there's been someone like standing out in the middle of the street r near enough to my house that I can kind of hear through windows, uh, just kind of like shouting violent things at the top of their lungs. And, uh, you know, this doesn't build to actual violence uh, uh, usually. Um, but listening to them, I've, I've been in situations where I've thought, should I call the police now? On the one hand, they're kind of yelling, uh, you know, this violent tirade in the middle of the street. On the other hand, um, if I call the police, are they just going to come and kill this person, right? right? Who, who most likely isn't going to actually do any harm. And it's never really crossed the threshold to, um, to a situation where I've called the police. I'm sure that if, uh, you know, I'm sure that if someone was out with a golf club smashing car windows uh, in that situation, I would call if I saw like some outward sign of violence, right? Uh, but, but I would like to live in the kind of city, and, and I don't think LA is one with, who knows what LAPD officers are going to respond. Um, I'd like to live in the kind of city where I could make the call at the earlier time when they're just shouting their heads off and think, okay, uh, someone who is trained to deal with these situations uh, and is not inclined to use violence unless it's absolutely necessary is going to come and uh, just be present here in case this does escalate. Right. Um, and in, in fact, that option is not available right now. There is no force to call that is going to come and attempt de-escalation. There is only a force that is going to come and escalate. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a shame. Uh, I was talking to someone about this the other day, actually, who said, oh, it's, it's too bad we don't have like some other people other than the police you can call who will just come and, and be like unarmed and helpful, uh, but trained. And uh, I really, uh, <laughs> in Venice, California, I really would enjoy that. I mean, this is this is a problem, especially potent, you know, low-income communities, and, and not even low-income communities, but just like mostly black or brown communities. I mean, you can, yeah. you can. it's not hard to imagine, and I've talked to people who have said this, um, I've talked to people who have said, you know, I live in a safe neighborhood, but sometimes, you know, the, you know, these, these, these guys in the corner, you know, worry me. I don't know what they're doing and I'd want to call the police. But if those kids just, if they end up just, if they end up just doing nothing, if those kids are just doing nothing, I don't want to risk the chance that they might, you know, have their lives ruined <laughs> because of a single interaction with the police. Um, right. And that's, I mean, that, that that's just, that's, that's a recipe that ultimately is a recipe for unsafe neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and this issue is even thornier because, um, you know, there's another video, um, I wrote about it. I don't know. I think others wrote about it. Maybe you saw it. It was, uh, a guy who was going to pick up his daughters at school and this is in Minneapolis yeah, I saw that. or maybe it was in St. Paul. Yeah. And he was basically sitting in the kind of skyway that connected to commercial buildings at, in an area that looked like it was just kind of a public lounge and someone called the police and, uh, 
the video kind of picks up after he's left the seating area and is just walking to pick up his kids and the police kind of escalate the situation and he ends up um, he ends up getting tased and arrested and the guy's really doing nothing wrong. Um, but that whole incident seems to have started from what we can tell from someone calling the police on this guy. Um, it's hard to imagine, you know, he was, I think, a 27-year-old. Uh, he was black with dreadlocks and he'd just gotten off work at um, some kind of restaurant. So I don't know if he was wearing a uniform. He was certainly probably wearing work clothes. It's hard to imagine um, a white guy in a suit and tie, uh, for that matter, maybe even uh, a clean-shaven black guy in a suit and tie, uh, eliciting the same, I'm going to call the police response, right? And so you think about uh, those kids on the corner uh, who are maybe doing something suspicious. Uh, there's this terrible problem where uh, people don't read the codes of other races the same as they read the codes for their own race. And, you know, uh, this causes black people and brown people who aren't doing anything wrong to get the police called on them uh, a disproportionate amount of the time. And I think that this helps explain, it's like one other factor other than just police policy itself that explains this disparity in interactions with the police. Um, and, and so even if you had a police force that uh, didn't respond with violence so often, there would still be this problem of, uh, of when to call them because a bunch of people just aren't going to read the codes right of when to call them. A bunch of people are going to see, um, you know, someone from an immigrant group, someone from a subculture that they're not a part of that dresses a different way than they dressed when they were in high school or something. Uh, they're not going to read those as like good, normal high school kids. They're going to read them as like, oh, scary people who are unfamiliar to right. I mean, And let's be frank. I mean, some people will just see a black guy hanging out and assume trouble. Um, uh, wow. on, on Twitter, someone uh, was tweeting about a recent experience he had just uh, dropping his kid off from school and walking back home and passing a woman who screamed at screamed and called the police. Um, and then, you know, a couple cops came and he was pretty much at the deal with the cops for his whole morning um, for, for yeah. no other reason than he was sort of walking and a woman saw him and immediately thought this man is going to harm me. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's sort of, it's weird because those things aren't, you know, statistically those things are not common, Right. But they're the kind of thing that if you are, you know, I, I'm, I'm a black guy, obviously, um, they weigh heavily on you. You sort of you should, could sort of imagine yourself in that position. And so it does begin yeah. to affect your everyday behavior, even if the odds of anything like that happening to you are very low. Um, yeah. And, I, and, you know, one thing actually, um, you know, you read about these issues a lot. Uh, one thing that I struggle with sometimes is um, that there's – very obvious and you know backed up by social science and statistics um, difference in how uh, black people are policed in America how um, Hispanics are policed in America it would be absurd to talk about you know um, racial profiling by Joe Arpaio without talking about um, the way the Hispanics are treated in that part of Arizona um, you just it, it would be absurd to talk about that guy in St. Paul without uh, talking about the racial context, right? right. Um, and at the same time, um, I never want to talk about these issues in a way that makes it seem as if um, people of all races aren't having negative interactions with police and and sometimes being abused by police. Partly because that's uh, you know the reality of it. There, you can find plenty of YouTube videos of uh, of white people being treated egregiously, of Asian people being treated egregiously. Um, but also because there's a way in which um, we still live in a tribal and sometimes racist country, and uh, and I don't want people to uh, think of this as only a problem that affects these other people, right? right? Uh, because it's a problem that affects anyone, and it's not that I want to like uh, cater what I write to uh, racists, but I really I just want to. Um, I want to get it right. I want to uh, reflect the full reality of it. And I think reflecting the full reality of it has this uh, side benefit of showing people that, look, this is a problem in every community. These interactions, yes, disproportionately affect people, um, 
who are black and Hispanic or other minority groups in different places where they're the minority group. Um, but, uh, you know, none of us is, uh, so long as there are police officers and police departments who escalate automatically and use force uh, in situations where it isn't warranted and kick down doors uh, after they've gotten the wrong address or burst into people's homes with flash grenades so that they can look to see if there's a little bit of marijuana there. Um, this is something that affects us all right. and that conceivably puts any of us in danger. Um, so it's kind of a thorny thing to, uh, because it's hard to put an exact number on like, oh, race matters X percent, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've grappled with that or ha how you've handled well, it. Well, I mean, um, so back in the 80s, um, I'm going to say it was William Julius Wilson in writing about sort of the, the problems of young working class black men saying that, listen, the complete collapse of opportunities for these young men is something of a canary in the coal mine for the rest of the country. That like the, the conditions that led to this and the conditions that will result are happening now among blacks, but will eventually spread outward because it's just how these things are. Um, blacks are sort of on the on the edge of an emerging trend. And and I think that's I think it's often been the case in American history with regards to like negative things that because blacks are you know at the bottom of the racial case as it were um, the the negative things that happen in, in our economy and our sort of social fabric hit them first and then sort of like move outwards um, and I I think I think sort of you know broadly speaking the police problem from militarization to aggressive policing to i mean escalation um and and aggressive policing in that in that manner um i think these are things that you know have been in the black community for a long time um and are now more than they were in the past kind of like emerging in other kinds of communities that don't share the same characteristics um which for me i think highlights you know, part of the need to, for as much as you, you want to talk about these things as something that affects all Americans, it also it also gives you a reason for why you want to focus on blacks and Latinos. If, if nothing else, as if to say, you know, you may want to ignore this, but eventually this will hit your neighborhoods too. Um, and if we can if we can stop police departments from treating the most vulnerable populations like this, we can you know ultimately protect you as you as well. Yeah, you know, I, I really think that the, um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the power of video to to change the way we talk and think about this issue. Um, I, I just think that it, it's it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to be someone who has a fundamental trust of the police and what they say and how they characterize situations. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that there are no police officers who are trustworthy, um, but if your fundamental stance is, yeah, you know, the police hardly ever do anything. And the truth right. Is terrible. They're dealing with criminals. And then you go and spend an hour on YouTube. It's very hard to come out at the other end with that same attitude. Or, or you spend, uh, I mean, or you spend just an hour in a mostly black neighborhood. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is hard for people to understand um, about the difference between, say, you know, a, a middle class white neighborhood and even sort of a working class black one is that a middle class white neighborhood just won't have a police presence. You will have to call the police for them to come there. Um, but in many black or Latino neighborhoods, the police are just there all the time. Right. Um, and that just creates uh, a different, a fundamentally different dynamic in your relationship with the police. Um, yeah. And you know, the other, and this is kind of apart from, um, from, urban policing, which is most of what we've talked about. Uh, but we also had this other pretty extreme uh, outburst of, of police brutality during the Occupy protests. Right. And, and, uh, and this is where the accountability piece drives me crazy. All, this, all of the Ferguson stuff, uh, when it comes, you know, there were police officers threatening journalists in Ferguson, as you know, I'm sure, and, and, uh, and all kinds of questionable police behavior caught on camera. Uh, in, in the course of that, but it's kind of been perhaps too soon for all of the machinery to work. Right. Whereas the Occupy protests have been over long enough uh, that we kind of saw how, uh, how the accountability worked, and it wasn't very good. I mean, um, Anthony Bologna, right, this guy in New York City who uh, basically 
pepper sprayed these women who were corralled off in this like orange police gear already. And I mean, we're the farthest thing from a threat to anyone. They were literally surrounded by like four other police officers and corralled in this like big orange police. Uh, I don't even know what you call it. And he just pepper sprays them as he walks by. Um, and for this, he gets just kind of like a slap on the wrist, right? Um, and he was high up in the NYPD brass. Um, and you saw all over the United States just um, really the violent suppression of some of these protests. And uh, you didn't hear a heck of a lot afterwards about police officers being uh, reprimanded in any way. It was just kind of, all right, this is what happened. Um, the difference is, you know, I'm sure you could have gone and seen the same thing if you went and looked at the uh, Vietnam War protests or the dock worker strikes of the 1930s, right? right. Uh, but we have video this time. And uh, really, that video makes all the difference. Right. And I mean, it's just, you know, regardless of the situation, I think people should be very concerned that you have, <laughs> we've empowered this core of people to use lethal force um, if they deem it necessary. And we essentially have no accountability. None. I mean, there are procedures, there's, again, administrative leave, but in terms of someone actually being punished for, for killing someone unjustifiably, uh, for using pepper spray against someone unjustifiably, it's virtually non-existent. Um, yeah. And that, I mean, <laughs> if we were, if this were another country, we would all be up in arms. Yeah, no, we, we absolutely would. Um, well, that's maybe a good note to move on to uh, an another topic. Um, I just published a big piece about Barbara Lee, the representative from the East Bay, like Berkeley and Oakland and uh, Alameda, everything, the lines shift around. That's basically been her district uh, since 1998. And she is the only person in Congress to have voted against the authorization to use military force that was passed a few days after 9-11. Um, and this was the subject of a really good radio lab piece on the AUMF uh, a while back. And it, they mentioned that the correspondence that people had sent Barbara Lee, both uh, thanking her for her vote as well as uh, excoriating her for her vote, <laughs> these were collected at Mills College in uh, Oakland. And so I went up there and looked at the correspondence. There's 12 boxes, and they gave me one big box of pro and one big box of, uh, of con. Uh, more than I could even look through in a day, uh, but they weren't sorted other than pro and con. And so I presumably got uh, a random sample and just looked at as many as I could. And um, man, the cons were depressing. <laughs> I mean, it was really um, the representative, the representative note was basically you disloyal traitor, uh, why are you siding with the terrorists? Um, there was a whole lot of, um, just a whole lot of invective and uh, not rational invective either. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I kind of expected, um, you know, as anyone who writes on the internet and gets emails and looks at comment sections get, you expect a percentage of comments to be like that. Yeah. Um, th th that is what internet comments have acculturated us to, unfortunately, is to expect some percentage of that. And I was thinking beforehand, like, is there going to be that? Because people are writing letters, they're signing their names. I presume there wouldn't be a lot of anonymous things. Is there something different about writing a letter and putting a stamp on it? I don't know. Um, but no, people signed their names. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to use the names because that was part of the agreement I had to make to get access to the things. But, uh, um, the unfortunate part about that is um, if there wasn't this restriction on the archive, I would have loved to track down as many people as I could right. have and, and say, here's what you wrote uh, back in 2001. What do you think about that now? Um, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear what, what people said. I mean, that. I'm sure a lot of people are just sort of, I don't know, consumed in this jingoistic hysteria. I mean, it's not the first time, it's really not the first time that's happened. I'm reading, um, Dana Goldstein's book on the history of teaching, the, the teacher wars, and there's a fascinating section on one um, let's see, New York teacher who was fired from her job. Um, she was an exemplary teacher, but fired from her job because she wouldn't sign a loyalty oath during the First World War. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was, um, it's funny you mentioned that. I was just 
So uh, my dad just went back to visit his family in Indiana, which is kind of where my dad's side of the family moved from Indiana to California. And like many Californians, my my understanding of history just goes back to like when my grandparents <laughs> came to California. <laughs> um, but, you know, they were German, as you might imagine from my last name, Friedersdorf, and I've never really like uh, identified as German in any way. Um, I think partly because I really don't really like the food. My mom's family's Cajun, and I like love Cajun food, so I kind of like identify with that a little bit more. But, uh, but my dad's family, um, on this trip, they sent like, oh, this is when the Friedersdorfs came to America. It was like 1830s or something. I don't know. Um, and I like clicked on this link that they had sent and started kind of going down this rabbit hole where I ended up reading about, um, German Americans during world war one. Um, uh, and there were lynchings of German Americans during world war one, which I had no idea. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there were also like, I would read about these kind of posses of citizens that would go around to German farms and like demand loyalty contributions to the war. And it was kind of like unclear, like you kind of had to give the money or something bad would happen to you, but it was also kind of unclear where the money was going. Um, yeah, it's just, man, American history, it's just uh, horrific all the way down. And whether you look in certain corners, it, of it, it, right? can, it can get um, pretty bleak. <laughs> I mean, you all, we all know about the awful biggest bleak things. Uh, and everybody studies slavery and everybody studies the internment of Japanese Americans. And, uh, but then you just, uh, I don't know. There's all these little things that no one really studies. <laughs> They're terrible. Uh, so we got well, we got off track here. So um, the positive letters to Barbara Lee were actually really um, uh, I found them kind of heartening that um, even in this terrible moment, so many people kind of had what I thought to be um, a pretty decent take. Yeah. And uh, and a, a lot of foresight and that they and that they took the time to wrote to write uh, when they weren't angry, which is always nice. Right. I mean, that's. <laughs> That's sort of what you want to encourage um, when, you, when you're on, you know, if you're on the, I guess, the less popular side or of, of an issue that's what you want to encourage people to do, write to their representatives calmly and, and nicely and, it's, and as often as possible um, because that yeah. leaves an impression. Yeah, it really does. Um, so, so what do you think about um, this whole debate about Syria and ISIS and Iraq and war powers and, and President Obama's plan that he's laid out? Man, um, you know, my my inclination generally is to be extremely skeptical of, uh, of you know, plans for intervening in other countries. Even, even in a case like this where, to a considerable extent, the circumstances are a result of our doing um, – Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing – so I don't know if you bake or not, but I bake a lot. Um, and one of the things about baking is that if you mess up early in the process, it's very hard to recover. Um, if you make yeah. some mistake in terms of the amount of ingredients you're putting in, ingredients you omitted, um, if you you know make a mistake in terms of you know actually you know, trying to make a custard or trying to temper some chocolate – there's only so much you can do to recover it. And I kind, of, I kind of feel like this is where we are with the Middle East and with Syria um, and Iraq in particular. Um, we have done so much damage um, that it's it's hard for me to conceive how we actually begin to recover from it and whether or not, and, and it's entirely possible that any attempt to recover from it um, or improve the situation will just make things worse. Um, yeah. And it's, it's tough because in the case of ISIS, I mean, these are really these are really horrible dudes. I mean, these are these are you know, it, it's rare in world history that you get genuinely bad guys, um, and these are genuinely bad guys. Uh, and so, you know, I, I I understand the impulse to want to do something. Um, I'm just not sure if there's anything we can do that would that would not end up ten years from now leading us to a situation where there's another ISIS we need to fight. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I part of me thinks that it all just comes down to um, the idea of what you do when it's unclear if you can improve things. If, if that is an impetus to go ahead and do your best anyway to intervene, right. or uh, if if that's an impetus to kind of uh, sit it out. And um, I I am definitely on the sit it out side of that. I've just 
seen too many instances uh, in recent history as well as uh, longer history of the United States making things much worse by intervening. Um, and I, I just, I, one thing that frustrates me about the country and its leadership is this, um, what, I think everyone else, uh, not everyone else, but a lot of other people, a majority of people are on the kind of uh, air on the side of intervening. Um, and also that there's kind of no sense of opportunity cost when it comes to these military interventions. Right. Um, you know, Obama, I don't know if it's already happened, but he's supposed to speak today about uh, his plan to help fight Ebola. Um, and it, it just seems like there are all of these things, right? Like e Ebola is instructive because it's killing a lot of innocent people. Um, it is affecting um, an area of the world that's terribly poor. Um, destabilizing that part of the world could have uh, implications for United States security that aren't really direct, but uh, certainly uh, are sort of the same as in the Middle East. Right. right? Um, and intervening in this case, right, means sending in uh, medical supplies and doctors. There's no blowback to that. There's no accidentally killing a bunch of people. There's no getting sucked into a larger war that you can't win. There's no uh, American troops coming home in body bags because they were killed by an IED. Um, it, it just seems like uh, if you're going to, if, if you have an opportunity to spend your money on one of these things or the other, um, why wouldn't you pick the thing that is like Ebola? Um, and it, it's even, I mean, even to the degree of the threat it poses, right? If you think about the most successful terrorist attack in U.S. history it killed less than 3,000 people. Um, and you go back to the flu pandemic of, I think it was like 1918 yeah, or something 19, like 19, that. 19. And it killed like tens of millions of people across the globe. I think like 650,000, um, something like that in the United States. Um, and yet when the Department of Homeland Security needs funds, it more or less gets them. Um, when the National Institute for Health or the World Health Organization needs its budget made whole, uh, it doesn't happen so much. And um, I, I really, you know, there's a lot of interesting policy conversations to be had about the particulars, but I really think it comes down to this weird way that we have of dealing with the risk of terrorism. Um, it, you know, viruses don't, uh, viruses can't make scary YouTube videos. Right. And, um, and so it just affects the way that we assess risk in a way that I would argue uh, is, is just irrational. Right. Uh, it's not to say that terrorism isn't a threat. It's just to say that um, we've been treating it for 13 years like it's the scariest thing. Obviously, it's obviously the scariest thing. It's obviously the number one priority. Um, and I don't think that that's the case. Right. And, and there's, you know, there's just no... I, I, I'm not sure American policymakers know how to exercise restraint. I mean, I, th I think to some extent they do, you know, Barack Obama has been, I think, far from ideal on foreign policy, but I also think that relative to the alter the actual alternatives on the table, he <laughs> he's been far more restrained in his conduct um, than, say, President John McCain would have been, or President Mitt Romney would have been, oh. or President Hillary Clinton would have been. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is sort of a sort of yeah, a soft I mean, bigotry of low expectation situation, but uh, I'll take what I can <laughs> yeah. get. But I mean, in general, I, I don't think I really do not think that you know very many American policymakers understand that strength does not equal projecting your projecting your power militarily. Um, that yeah, so it, it seems as if so many um, policymakers don't actually understand that the United States is a massive superpower of sort of world historical strength. Um, economically as much as militarily um, and diplomatically and that we have this whole basket of tools to use to achieve our goals and that military force really does need to be at the forefront of them um, and it, what, what's crazy to me is that this perspective is seen as somehow soft um, when it really isn't right. at all yeah you know I and, and I share your um, I share your judgment that John McCain uh, or 
probably Mitt Romney, although he's the less clear of them to me, but I would guess still yes. Uh, and, and Hillary Clinton, they would be more uh, aggressive um, in, in a way that I thought was, was foolhardy. Um, and, you know, I, despite my skepticism, I am not, I've not come forward and said, this is what I think we should do about ISIS. I'm under no illusion that this is a problem that Same. I have the solution to. Um, the one, the one area where I would fault Obama and where he really, uh, vexes and frustrates me, um, is that I think that, um, over the last few years on a bunch of different issues, he has, um, he's done things in a way that has kind of short circuited what I think ought to be a broad national debate that incorporates Congress. I think that these things, uh, just like I thought Libya was something that Congress should have voted on. I think that this is something that Congress should properly vote on. And it's not that I have great faith in the United States Congress, um, as like the particular people that are in it right now. Um, but I, I do think that, um, what happens when the president just goes and does these things on his own is that there's just like no accountability mechanism. Obama's going to leave office in, in a couple of years. He's not going to be up for reelection at all. We only have to look back to 2008 and see the importance of something like the Iraq war. Right. Um, you know, you know, without that, Obama wouldn't have won the presidency. He wouldn't have been able to critique Hillary Clinton's foreign policy. Uh, voters wouldn't have been able to kind of express uh, their desire for someone who, um, who, didn't support that. And I would love to have, um, I would love to have the Congress on record, um, on a bunch of different votes going back five or six years, because, um, when they do something foolhardy abroad, when they encourage it, it's a lot easier to go and find someone to challenge them and campaign against right. them when, when they have a vote that they had to take and they had to take a stand. They weren't just able to kind of say a bunch of things to make it seem one way. And then like, events on the ground started to change, so they made some other comments. Uh, you can nail them down with a vote. And I think that nailing them down is a really important part of representative democracy. Right. I agree. I agree completely. Um, let's see. Well, I think uh, we've gone through all our topics. Anything exciting we can look from for from you at Slate uh, in coming days? Uh, nothing in, nothing, nothing in, in particular, just the usual. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I encourage people to go check out the usual um, and uh, go to Slate, go to the Atlantic uh, and hopefully we'll talk again sometime and uh, maybe, maybe have, maybe have happier news on at least one of these fronts. <laughs> yeah. All right. All righty. Thank you.